Good afternoon and welcome to the State Board of Education meeting for June 14th of 2022. We're going to begin today with our Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to lead that since Dr. Stapleton's not with us today. And it's a special occasion to do it because you all know today's Flag Day. Pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before you sit, I'm going to go off the script and ask that we have a moment of silence for the victims of the tragedy in Texas last month. So if you join me, please. Thank you. All right, our next order of business is the minutes from May 17th. Is there any objection to approving the minutes as presented? Hearing none, the minutes are approved by unanimous consent. Our next item is today's agenda. Is there any objection to approving the agenda as presented? Hearing none, the agenda is approved by unanimous consent. Do we have any sign-in sheets for, I know we've got some guests we're going to recognize in just a moment. Let's see what we have here. We have, looks like Ms. Hogan, Mr. McCoy from Greenville Schools, Ruth Howell, Spartanburg Five, Ann Connolly Clare, Porter Gowd, Jennifer Clare, Porter Gowd, Matthew Van Vliet, Spartanburg, Jennifer Hines, Abbeville, and Stephen Hines said, we're going to introduce all those folks here in a minute. Cody Kriegsman looks like our guest for today. Welcome to all of you. We're glad to have you with us. Next item up will be the state board chair report. And uh, did I miss something? Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, my report really this month is just... Um, in my line of work as a district safety director, the events in Texas have really hit home for me. So uh, you may have seen that we put out to the State Department an op-ed piece with some suggestions for safety ideas. And uh, we're also going to have a safety update in today's program uh, on today's agenda. Certainly, teachers can't teach, kids can't learn. Parents are distracted and trying to go about their daily lives and work if everybody's worried about safety in our schools. Uh, I know it's always been a top priority for us. It's going to continue to be a top priority for us. But I did want to have that added to today's agenda. So a little later, we're going to talk some more about that. So, Madam Superintendent, you're up next. Sir, let's see. Testing. Is that good? You hear me okay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I got such uh, practice of sitting at that table, I, I forgot to come up and sit by you. So <laughs> thank you. And thank you for your remarks. Thank you for remembering the families, the victims, and precious students in Uvalde. And um, my heart goes out to all of them. And I, I appreciate you, particularly because of your interest in school safety and giving us always kind of a little nudge and keeping that fire lit under us that makes sure we're doing everything we're supposed to do. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I, I really appreciate you and your, your interest in school safety. A few things I want to share with you today. Uh, it's been kind of an exciting week or two because we've been able to give some really good news to some places who work hard and uh, are out in areas of the state that we don't often get to go visit, and hand, particularly go visit and hand them a check for some money. So I, um, I have really enjoyed, this has been a year-long process. As you know, the State General Assembly appropriated $100 million dollars in the last year, July 1, in this current year's budget, and gave the responsibility to the Department of Education to decide a procedure to reward or, or award that money to districts in greatest need, our poorest districts, and then those districts with the greatest, highest priority of building needs. Uh, it took a while, that it's taken us almost all year, 
to get that all done. Uh, we first came up with a formula. Uh, the General Assembly gave us some, some parameters to use the school district index of taxpaying ability and the wealth of the people who live there uh, in that county or in that school district. And then we added the taxpaying ability of the county. So there were three criteria to, to determine who were indeed were the poorest districts and then they're rated all the way through all, um, all of our districts in the state. And then after that, the next part was a little more difficult because we needed a, a non-impartial uh, review of facilities. Sometimes folks will say, we need a new building, and compared to someplace else in the state, they, they probably do need it, but the need may be greater somewhere else. So I want to thank uh, Virgie Chambers and her office worked on this. Our finance office worked on this. State procurement worked with us, and we, we procured uh, three vendors who assisted architects, construction folks, who came together to decide how would we review the buildings uh, to do a, a uniform facility study, and then how to go out and do that. We asked them to go first to the five poorest districts in the bottom 10, and then now they're working on the bottom 25. And that they would give us recommendations, their top recommendation, and some alternative uh, recommendations uh, based on what I asked them to look at. We want long-term uh, sustainability, let this last for 35, 50 years down the road. And if there were some tough decisions that needed to be made in those communities, to recommend that to us, not to be afraid of tough decisions like, for instance, in Lee County, there were three tiny elementary schools that had served that county for a long, long time, 100 years probably, and all three were old buildings, and which was more efficient, to repair those three buildings or to make the decision to consolidate into one large elementary school that would serve the entire county. So they recommended their top was, first recommendation was to consolidate Bill 1, and then there was an alternative plan if, if the district did not agree to that. So it took a while. And so uh, we recently began announcing the first uh, appropriations from that. And you can see uh, we did a press release, press conference, and uh, this is the very first allocation. Uh, and I would tell you that the difference there, you see ESSER or state. The agency also, I felt like I needed to make a commitment to assist with this from our agency money, so we set aside 38 million, right at 40 million actually, of our state ESSER funds, of our state agency ESSER funds, of which was about 200 million, to go to this project. And so that increased the fund to 140 million that we had to appropriate. So last week we began announcing Dillon Districts 3 and 4 received 15 million from our ESSER fund. Saluda County received, uh, and the Dillon three and four, that is to assist in consolidating two elementary schools into one and then do some renovations in one district will, which would allow them to close an old building, add a wing, and, and consolidate students at one place, much more efficient. Saluda to build a new elementary school that would consolidate two elementary schools uh, and some other projects. Uh, Lee County, I mentioned that, and then in Clarendon, this would go toward a new elementary school at one of our oldest buildings in the state, Walker Gamble, uh, out in the Turbyville area. Now, all three of these, all four of these districts have other needs. This doesn't take care of everything, but it certainly moves them along because a mill of tax in one of these districts brings in somewhere between twenty to probably $50,000. So it would take a whole lot of meals uh, to build a school. So I am thrilled. I appreciate the General Assembly for supporting us. 
Uh, we will be soon making more announcements because we've got the hard part behind us. Now, as the money comes, we can start appropriating, and the conference committee just met this week, and we have an additional $140 million to appropriate. So we'll be able to move on down the line, or up the line, however you want to look at it, to fund additional projects. Uh, so it's very exciting. Everybody wants to know if they're on the list. There's some other funding that we know will happen uh, soon, and... Um, not everybody's getting everything they want, but this certainly is a real boost. So I'll be happy to answer any questions about this if you all have received questions or if, you, if I didn't cover something. Any questions? Okay, thank you. And Katie Neal just, uh, I had not put a slide in on this, but Katie has done a superb job. She and Kinsey this year representing us over at the State House. And we really, the General Assembly was very, very supportive of, of our request and I, all of our major requests were funded and I'm just so appreciate, appreciative of them, but it doesn't happen without some really good people representing us. And Katie, Kinsey, y'all have done a great job this year, so thank you very much. If you'll give us just a brief overview. So, um, as Superintendent Spearman mentioned, the conference committee meet, met on Friday morning of last week, and the, the General Assembly is coming in tomorrow morning to vote on those conference reports. So, as soon as everything is finalized, um, and that that also does not include, then the governor will have five days to take up vetoes, and the General Assembly will then come back again probably next week or the following week to take up and override any vetoes that they may choose to do so. So after all of that is finalized, I'll make sure to type up a, a really good summary and send it out to you all so you know exactly what's included. Some things to put on your radar that I don't foresee changing, which I hate saying that, but I really don't foresee these changing. Um, as Superintendent Spearman mentioned, the $140 million additional in capital improvement funding, a 5% bus driver salary increase. Uh, the starting teacher salary and the minimum salary schedule being moved up to 40000 and then each of those cells behind it being moved up as well. Um, the new funding formula, which I will come back and bore you with details another time on that. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is that the teacher supply check funding did go up to $300 um, from, I think it was 275 previously. And then the last thing is the proviso that we did talk about last meeting, last month, the teacher, the breach, um, teacher breach of contract proviso, um, that was taken out during conference committee. So that is no longer included in the budget. And if you have any questions now or later, I'm happy to answer them whenever you, you have them. Any questions? Well, thank you so much. Y'all have done a wonderful job this year. It's a lot to keep up with. Well, it's, it's more fun. It's a lot easier when there's a lot of extra money. Absolutely. <laughs> and there was a lot of uh, the economy, thank goodness, uh, has done really, really well in South Carolina. It's not often that we have a billion dollars, but we ended up having almost three billion in extra revenue this year. So it made, it made the debate uh, a little easier. So thank you to the General Assembly and, and our folks. Some more good news. We want to celebrate students. Uh, this past week, I was thrilled to participate with Dominion Energy and uh, a student writing contest winners luncheon where we recognized five women, young women, all women. So you guys have got to start working a little harder on your creative writing because the women took the, took the day and the... Um, they received uh, a MacBook. Each, child, each student received a MacBook and a thousand dollar prize for their local school. So it was well worth the effort. Uh, this is our second year, and Dominion most, does most all the work. But uh, this does. Uh, there was we added the lunch in this year, and I think this year they had a hundred applicants. 100 essays, so I'm sure that's going to grow and grow. But it's called the Strong Men and Women in South Carolina History Student Writing Contest. And our winners were, and they're divided into the regions of the state from the CSRA region. That's where I used to play basketball. That's the Augusta, Saluda, Aiken area. Uh, CSRA and our science fair was always over at CR CSRA. Uh, Tylee Spiller was our winner. Uh, Haley Hilton from the Low Country, uh, 
Shania Jeffcoat from the Midlands, Jayla Jones from PD, and Sarah Winkler from the Upstate. And just a special word about Jayla Jones in the PD. She's actually from Lake City, South Carolina. And the students were asked to write about an African-American leader who has had great impact on their life. And Jay, some wrote about people who are deceased. Um, but Jaylee wrote about her superintendent, Dr. Laura H Hickson, in uh, Florence 3, which is Lake City. And she was, Laura was the only person who was written about that was actually in attendance. So it's very, very special and uh, a beautiful plaque given to each of these students along with their essay engraved on their plaque. So it's quite nice. And they actually, you see a picture there of Dr. Hickson uh, and Jaylee. Uh, in the middle there of that second photo with uh, Laura got a copy of the essay as well. So hats off to great superintendent leadership that's impacting students' lives. Molly, did, did, did Keller speak? Keller spoke a lot, and he did an outstanding <laughs> job. He can talk, can he? He can talk, but he talks my language. A good old country boy from Calhoun County who's risen up to the top of Dominion Energy and a great supporter of our public school system. So Keller did a wonderful job. Uh, with his remarks. And now we get to recognize some outstanding teachers. The Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Training, two of our most important content areas and always so important. If you had a really good math teacher when you were in school or a really good science teacher, it made life a whole lot easier as you went on your way, particularly if you were going on to college or in our technical schools. So great math and science teachers are so important. And we've got three with us today. And I'm going, this is the highest honor bestowed by the United States government for K-12 science, technology, engineering, math, or computer science teaching. It was established in 1983. There are 100 teachers in South Carolina who have won this award. And we're going to add three more today. And I'm going to call on Monique Curry to come up. Monique runs this program here in the agency for us. So Monique, come and share with us our winners. Good afternoon. Um, the PAINTS Award is broken down into two segments. We have the K through 6 segment and the 7 through 12. The award recognizes those teachers that have both deep content knowledge of the subjects that they teach and the ability to motivate and enable students to be successful in those areas. During our 2022 K through 6 award period, a committee of esteemed educators reviewed the South Carolina applications submitted and elected finalists from each category, math and science, to represent our state as a part of South Carolina's incredible teaching force. The three finalists we are honoring today have demonstrated through their expertise the positive impact of effective teaching on student achievement. We truly thank you for your mark in education as you mold our next generation and wish you the best of luck as you have entered the next steps of the PAMPS Award. Okay, would you like, do I get the honor? Yes. Okay, the stay honor. right there and I'm gonna ask the board chair, would you go stand with uh, Monique? We did pictures already outside, so uh, Mr. Kinsey, recognized his, his winner. Why don't you go and we'll, uh, first of all, uh, our, from Porter Gout School down in the Low Country, Miss Jennifer Clare. Jennifer, if you'll come up and I think you're going to receive again your plaque. And from Mr. Kinsey up in Spartanburg, South Carolina at Lyman Elementary School, Ruth Howell. <laughs> and 
I'm from Cherokee <coughs> Trail Elementary in Abbeville County, not far from Due West. I think she actually lives in Due West, the home of Kathy Hazelwood, our Chief Legal <laughs> Counsel, Miss Jennifer Hines. Jennifer. Rose Shields. Thank you, Dr. Shields. And I would like to ask their families. Mr. Hines is here. I know Miss Claire has her daughter. Uh, and also, Mr. Hines, let's see, who else am I missing? And Mr. Howell, stand up, because it takes a family to support all these wonderful teachers. <laughs> Thank you all for teaching, uh, for being a teacher, but especially for choosing to be a teacher in South Carolina. We're, we're indebted to you. Thank you for your great work. And Mr. Chairman, I believe that concludes my report for today. And that was the best part, too. That's always the greatest uh, part of this uh, program that we have today is when we get to recognize students and teachers. Yes, so sir. thank you all once again. Okay. But now back to the business at hand. Our next item is public comment. I don't believe, we, let's see, we did have one sign up for public content and Stephen, is it Hines? Or maybe just signed the wrong sheet. <laughs> okay. Yep. All right. So no public comments for today. <laughs> maybe next time. How about the parliamentarian? Do you have any comments for us? I do, and they're not as happy as Molly's. Um, we are going to have to have a called meeting in all likelihood because we will not be meeting in July. There will not be a state board meeting, but in order, because you guys have taken up so many of our educator cases, we can have a little bit of a lull uh, for July, but we will need you to approve the new safety checklist. So you're going to get more information about the um, safety issue, but I do want to put that on your radar right now that um, there is no July meeting, but we, I will probably be reaching out um, shortly trying to get a, a date. It'll be a very brief special called meeting, but we're going to need to have one. And uh, Madam Parliamentarian, so uh, virtual will be an option? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. It will be virtual. <laughs> yes. Okay. We'd love to see you, but we just don't want to see you on that day. So. <laughs> Thank you. All right, now on to our state board items. Uh, the first is a policy and legislative committee report. We met this morning um, and we had two items that were for approval. We're going to start with the first one is a request for approval from the school district of Greenville County for schools of innovation designation. Uh, Ms. Destasio is here and a little background as she's coming up with it. The uh, committee, there were actually four items uh, requested within that action item. So uh, the first one, the committee voted uh, to deny that particular request. So there's going to be three, though, that will be coming forward to the full board uh, for our consideration. So with that, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much um, for having me back again this month. Um, I am going to go over, um, I know I mentioned some of this last month, but I'm going to do a, an overview as well just in case um, I know some, some members were not here last month. Um, under Section 59-19-350, which is known as the Schools of Innovation designation, the legislature allows um, for creating an avenue for new, innovative, or more flexible ways of educating children. And so as a part of that process, um, districts are required to identify specific statutes or regulations, which uh, would need to be considered for exemption in order for them to carry out that new, innovative, or more flexible approach. Um, this also requires that the local school board uh, review and vote for each exemption um, before bringing it to the State Board of Education. And so that has all occurred as well. Um, I noted this morning at the Policy and Legislative Committee, um, this special designation of schools of innovation um, is not quite the same thing as other types of waiver pathways um, that are typically associated with continuous improvements, such as um, those with district strategic plans, where when one district um, could be granted that waiver, other similarly situated districts would, would also be granted. Um, this is a special designation for schools of innovation, and so has to be considered 
um, in the context of the specific individual district who is bringing this request around the very specific statutes and regulations that they are requesting exemption from, and the rationale for each of those, and also um, as a part of this process, um, they, when those uh, statutes, regulations, and policies are um, identified, a part of that process is that each year by July 1st, um, there is an annual review of the waiver by the department, um, and that requires the district to report on data um, in order for us to provide oversight on the information which was contained in their request. Um, and a review process of the processes and procedures in their the plan which was submitted by the district and voted upon by their local school board as part of the submission. And then every three years, the state board would need to review that data, which has been collected annually and reviewed, to make a decision about whether or not to reauthorize based on um, the outcome of, of what has transpired. And that would be if that district were to seek reauthorization, then it would, it would be reviewed those, those three years. Um, and so again, the aim of the Schools of Innovation waiver is just to have that, that three-year time period where a district with annual monitoring is able to try that new, innovative, um, or more flexible approach. And so, again, um, it would need to be in the context of capacity and resources of the individual district. So um, with Greenville, what we are bringing forward, um, as Chairman Walters mentioned, are, are three specific areas around which um, the, uh, under the Schools of Innovation designation uh, waiver uh, exemptions have been requested. The first one is around the exemption of requirements um, for hiring non-certified staff, um, there is a limitation of no more than 25% of non-core teachers at the elementary level at any given school, um, no more than 25% um, at the middle and high schools in any you know, content or career as well. Um, and this, those teachers would have baccalaureate or graduate degrees in the subjects in which they are teaching. Um, and and that, uh, that, again, that exemption do, is capped at 25%. Um, Greenville, as uh, mentioned before, does have a pathway um, and a plan for these teachers to achieve certification. Um, and so this is a way in which they can begin to onboard staff which may not yet have a certification but have that pathway forward. Uh, the second area is around the exemption for physical education requirement in middle school only. Uh, and this is under very specific circumstances. Um, the district, uh, and this would not happen at the school level, it would, it would be district oversight. Uh, students who are needing or wanting to take a year-long class, such as band, strings, chorus, um, but who are also needing um, an intensive um, resource or inter intervention course for academics, um, allowing those students the option to pursue their passions and interests to, to help them remain engaged and excited about school, um, that there would be a pathway and an option, again, at the district level to consider allowing those students to opt out of PE. Uh, they would still maintain the health, the required health piece, um, but they would, would not take PE in, in that middle school to, to have their, their other elective. Uh, part of the data in, in Greenville's plan around this, they will be collecting and looking at outcomes. Uh, these students, when they do go to high school, they will have to take that PE requirement for graduation. And so one of the pieces of um, information that is going to be collected is how do those students do when they get to PE? And then also making sure that they are, um, they are maintaining some physical activity as well. So they have, they have a pretty robust plan around that. Uh, the final piece is the exemption from the 120-hour seat time requirement, uh, and this is through a program credit by examination, um, and this would apply uh, for all the high schools in Greenville County and middle schools where um, students are taking high school credit courses. Again, this would not be done. These exams are not going to be created individually uh, by teachers. This will be done at the district level. There will be a district level process for applying to participate in credit by examination. Um, and they will be, um, again, using their resources to make sure that those examinations are rigorous, cover the state standards, um, and again, are, are uniform across the entire Greenville County school system. So those are the, the three um, areas 
which have been requested under this schools of designation. Schools okay. of Innovation, I'm sorry, designation. Thank you for that. Don't go far. So the way we're going to proceed with this is, is that first of all, uh, the first request that was made of the P&L committee was for an exemption of the section to allow schools to begin the school year before the third Monday in August. Um, that one was not recommended by the State Department, and so the committee voted to deny that request. So that one is already off the table for this afternoon. It's been dealt with. So we have three remaining. Each of those uh, is uh, comes as a motion from the committee. It does not require a second. So what we'll do is it, I'll announce each one. We'll have a chance for questions and discussions. We'll vote on each individual request and do it in that manner. So the second one that comes up here is uh, the first one we're going to consider for action this afternoon is the exemption of the requirement that would allow schools to hire non-certified staff I know I asked you this this morning, but I want to ask you again for the benefit of whoever may be watching as well. Uh, I believe there's a budget proviso that closely mirrors the language of this request anyway. So uh, our action could be a moot point. It could be statewide. Correct. You are correct about that. Um, when this was submitted, clearly this has been a process that, that we have been going through. And so uh, at the time that this was submitted, and, and even now, we, we don't know if that is, is going to go through, which is why it was included. But yes, that is correct. Okay. Other questions? I, I'll just say, <clears throat> excuse me, add a comment. And I think, Katie, Neil, just correct me if I'm wrong. I think the proviso that's in the budget is actually more expansive than what Greenville is asking for because it has no cap and it does not limit it to any, doesn't require a four-year degree, I guess, either. So um, it I'm is in, defer it, to Katie on that one. Yeah, uh, it is in the budget. Uh, you know, the, the journey is not completely over because the governor and his staff gets a look at that. So he could veto that, maybe not, maybe does, and then the legislature would have to act to see if there's enough support to overturn that. But just, just so everyone understands that if that were to pass, it's even more expansive than what Greenville is requesting. Yeah, so it does require the four-year degree, um, but it opens it to any geographic or subject area that's a critical needs area. So that's... Um, Everything. Yes. And there's no cap at there's 25 percent. No, correct. No, ma'am. There is no cap on that. And from a legal standpoint, if the proviso passes, then it prevails over any action we take today anyway. Is that correct? Okay. And Mr. Chair, also, um, the 25 percent, let's see, what was the other, I, I had something on my mind that was another stipulation. Oh, this matches, I think what Greenville has requested matches what is allowed now in our charter schools, which are also public schools. So there is precedent uh, in our public school system for this. Are there any other questions or comments in regard to this item? Hearing none, we'll call for the question. All those in favor, vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no, and that item carries. The next item was the exemption of physical education in middle school under specific special circumstances. And anybody have any questions or comments about that one? That was strictly in middle school. Hearing none, we'll call for the question. All those in favor of vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no, and the motion carries. The final one was the exemption from the 120-hour seat time requirement that would allow the implementation of a credit by examination system. And that would, exemption would apply to all middle and high schools. Are there any questions or comments in regard to that item? Hearing none, we'll call for the question. All those in favor of vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. And the motion carries. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you very much. And we had another uh, action item on uh, our meeting agenda this morning. That was approval of an allocation under Proviso 1.88B to Clarendon County School District. Uh, I think that was some funds of like $150,000 uh, for them. That was approved by the committee and placed on the consent agenda. And then we had one information item. It was a list of waivers that were approved by the State Department. So. 
you might have any questions about the P&L report. Hearing none, I'll recognize Ms. Lee to present the Educator Professions Committee report. Thank you, Chairman Walters. The Education Professions Committee approved two action items this morning. Item one is a new Educator Preparation Program approval recommendation, Anderson University Education Specialist and Educational Systems Administration with Superintendent Certification. Item two is the Teach for America partnership with Liberty STEAM Charter School. The committee did not hear any information items this morning. The committee placed these two action items on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. Lee? Hearing them, we'll move on to the Standards Learning and Accountability Report. And Mr. Brennan, I think you were chairing that today. Thank you. Thank for you, Mr. Chair. Yes, in. normally this is uh, uh, Ms. Frierson's uh, committee, but uh, she had a family situation she needed to attend to today, so I, I agreed to chair the committee just for today. There were two action items presented to the committee. Uh, for approval. The first was the approval of an addition of a product for the addition list of formative assessments. Uh, Dr. Tanaka uh, made a presentation uh, around that. The purpose of this item is to request approval for the addition of the product to this list uh, of assessments that school districts may purchase with funds appropriated by the General Assembly and used to improve student performance in accordance with their district improvement plans. That was approved by the committee. The second one was the approval of the selection of the state textbook depository. Ms. Luther presented that uh, to us. Uh, again, the state board has to approve this. Uh, the South Carolina Publishers Association selection of R.L. Bryan Company as the central textbook textbook depository to distribute all, all materials was approved by the South Carolina Publishers Association annual meeting. And in, and in accordance with that, this, this committee did approve the selection of the R.L. Bryan uh, Company. Those two items were both placed on the consent agenda. We had one uh, information item that, that Ms. Luther presented to us, and that was uh, regarding State Board at Reg 4371-3B, free textbooks state, the State Department of Education shall provide a schedule of instructional materials, allocation formulas to the State Board of Education information annually, and she did, in fact, uh, do that. Again, items 01 and 02 were placed on the consent agenda, and that's the report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Any questions for Mr. Brennan? Ms. Chapman, you had a busy morning once again today, <laughs> you and your committee. Uh, so we're going to do the Educator Licensure Committee report, and let me note for the other board members, since the full board committee did not meet this morning, uh, once she's completed that report, we're going to have to ratify those cases. So with that, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. We took action on 27 cases this morning, and I'd like to make the motion that the State Board of Education ratify the actions of the committee for the cases listed below. I'm going to do part of the cases, and then Dr. Woodall will finish them. State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Shamika Carrie Ann Benjamin, certificate 281141, commencing June 14, 2022, and ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Number two, the State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Megan Berger. Bergeron, Certificate 296753, commencing June 14, 2022, and ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Number three, the State Board of Education suspends the Certificate of Lisa King Browning, Certificate 277766, commencing June 14, 2022, and ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. State, excuse me, case four, the State Board of Education dismiss, di dismissed the matter related to the suspension of the certificate of Rashawn Alicia Coates, 
Certificate 269174, and will issue an order of dismissal. Case 5, the State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Jennifer Julia Cumio, Certificate 297550, commencing on June 14, 2022, and ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Case 6, State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Vanessa Hewitt DeVore, certificate 277154, commencing June 14, 2022, and ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Case 7, State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Sarah Drummond, certificate 258852 commencing June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Number eight, the State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Amanda L. Edmonds, certificate 267042, commencing on June 14, 2022, and ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Case 9, State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Novella Seabrook Fortner, certificate 289958, commencing June 14, 2022, and ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Case 10, the State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Michael Paul Foster, certificate 287672, commencing June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Case number 11, State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Samantha Mariah Frazier, certificate 275022, commencing June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Case 12, State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Amber Barnhill Fryer, certificate 293090, commencing June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Case 13, the State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Caitlin LaBelle Hux, certificate 301565 commencing June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Case 14, the State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Monica Yvette Reagan Huey, certificate 280921, commencing June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the consent order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. Case 15, the State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Lisa L. LaVenture, certificate 260340, commencing June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. The State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Anthony S. Lowndes, certificate 262158, commencing on June 14, 2022, and ending on June 13, 2024, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct. The State Board of Education suspends the certificate of James Michael Mears, certificate 151429, commencing on June 14, 2022, ending on June 13, 2023 and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. The State Board of Education publicly reprimands Naomi Faith Motes, Certificate 286678, and approves the order of public reprimand on the grounds of unprofessional conduct. The State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Jennifer Marie Mummert, Certificate 274211, commencing on June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. The State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Catherine Eugenia Morrell, certificate 295458, commencing on June 14, 2022, 
ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. The State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Ross Allen Nettles, certificate 265212, commencing on June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. The State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Alexis Ray Nystrom, certificate 282775, commencing on June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. The State Board of Education suspends the certificate of David Allen Rose, certificate 290433, commencing on June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. The State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Artika Yannette Shannon, certificate 293375, commencing on June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct for breach of contract. The State Board of Education suspends the certificate of Laurie E. Smith, certificate 164063, commencing June 14, 2022, ending June 13, 2023, and approves the order of suspension on the grounds of unprofessional conduct. The State Board of Education publicly reprimands Alexandra Cannon Steele, certificate 258084, and approves the order of public reprimand on the grounds of unprofessional conduct. The State Board of Education publicly reprimands Angel M. Troxler, Certificate 266949, and approves the order of public reprimand on the grounds of unprofessional conduct. This completes our report. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll call for a motion to ratify the actions taken by the Educator Licensure Committee. Do I have a motion? Motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. And I have second. a second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. And those cases are ratified. That was 27 cases in case you lost count. And Ms. Chapman, I want to thank you and your committee for your diligent work with this. Madam Superintendent, I want to thank the Office of General Counsel. Uh, we looked at some numbers, uh, Ms. Hazelwood, and more teacher cases have been heard in the first six months of this year than were heard in all of 2021. So it's really a, a big effort going into making sure these cases are handled in a timely manner. So thanks to everybody involved with that. As I stated, there is, there is no full board uh, license committee meeting today. So we can move on to consideration of the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. And the consent agenda is approved. Now we'll move into our reports. And Dr. Mathis, you've got a literacy update for us. Chairman Walters and board members, I'm going to give you a brief update. Um, in one of our, our um, projects, we have started funding through our ESSER initiative, and that's our Learning Object Repository, which we've talked to you a little bit about before. But we have, in South Carolina, we refer to it now as our South Carolina Instruction Hub. And we are receiving um, um, national recognition um, and attention for the work that we've, we've done with the um, learning object repository. Um, I think we're probably the only state in um, the only state that has a statewide learning object repository. So <clears throat> while there are purchase materials such as Math Nation and Discovery Education um, in our hub, there's much more. By August of this year, when our teachers return, um, the learning object repository, our instruction hub, will have lesson plans and unit plans um, for teachers to access. Um, we have a team of approximately 30 teachers currently working on our social studies lessons and unit plans for each grade um, level that, and these lesson plans are strictly aligned to our South Carolina uh, content standards. 
And as you remember over the past few months that we adopted in social studies instructional materials, as we went through that process, we, we realized and know that there are, a, a teacher needs more than a textbook um, to, to effectively teach the, the classroom lessons and the lessons that we are accessing, that will be accessed through the instruction hub, will do that. Um, the lesson plans follow the South Carolina teaching rubric, and that is the rubric that all of our teachers are evaluated on, so they know that well. This mirrors uh, that rubric, and um, in addition to social studies, we will have um, English language arts, so literacy lessons and math lessons for all of our grade levels. And um, our next step, our next phase will be science and our career and technology courses. I passed out a, um, a, a screenshot of, of what, when a teacher goes into the instruction hub to access or create a lesson plan, all of these um, areas are emphasized, but this is a part of what the lesson plan will look like. And if any of you have been around for a while in South Carolina and remember the days of PET, um, it, it looks a lot like that, and um, so we really didn't reinvent the wheel because that was very effective at the time. But you see the components there that will be a part of the lesson plans, the daily check-in, making sure that we connect those lesson plans to prior learning, um, making sure that the purpose of the lesson and the students understand that. Um, any new learning is done through direct instruction. There's collaborative practice, independent practice, um, there is assessment of student work and, in each of the plans, and that's a critical piece that students get feedback on their work. And then an opportunity for lesson reflection and closure of the lesson. We know one of the most impactful parts of student learning is if they can reflect um, on what they've learned, and so we want to make sure that's part of the, the lesson plan. Our hope is teachers and administrators will benefit from the model lesson plans created by some of the best teachers in our state. And these model lessons will serve as a model to all of our teachers, um, but strictly that they are aligned to the depth of our standards. You've heard me say before, if we want to increase student achievement, we got to teach to the depth of the standards. And these lessons are models um, for that. Teachers will have the flexibility to use these lessons as they are, lift them out and use them. I call them the HelloFresh version because it all comes in a, a, a packaged with the instructions and all the ingredients. So you can use the HelloFresh version, or if you're a good cook or a chef, you can take that lesson plan and make it useful for you and change it to meet the needs of your classroom. Um, the plans we feel like will benefit um, all teachers that access these, but I think where I see some of the strongest benefit is for our first year teachers, our new teachers who are in the classrooms and they don't have the resources yet um, and they struggle to get those. So this will be a great place for them to go and utilize those lesson plans. So um, I'll be glad to entertain any questions, but in August we really hope you all will dive into our Learning Object Repository and find out what a great resource it is in our state. Teachers can only have to go to one place and get all of these resources. Dr. Mathis, I love this program, but how did you incentivize people to participate? Were they paid or did they for get the renewal writing credits? the lesson plans? Right. Yes, we, we do offer a stipend for that. Um, that, that is um, their expertise, their time in doing that. Um, but hopefully the real reward is they will get for sharing with others. But yes, we did. Well, there's so many fantastic teachers. I just wondered if they, how the general teacher across the state knew about participating? We put out a call to our instructional leaders okay. through that to ask them, um, Dr. Woodall, our next step, um, <clears throat> what we would like to do is reach out to our um, state teachers of the yeah. year across the, the state and ask them to contribute um, lesson plans as well. Mr. Brennan? Dr. Mathis, uh, the assessment product, the student work, I assume that is more of of something in a formative it is. nature than a summative it, Exactly, and so nature. it's on the spot um, assessment in that day so the teacher knows I've got to correct something tomorrow. It's very formative and they can go back and do okay. that. Okay, very good, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Mathis? I was just gonna say one more thing. When we move into our flexibility of the certified staff, this will be such a gift to the content specialists who don't have pedagogy training. Right. 
we'll know that they can pull from this and be instantly successful as far as how to present, which is the piece they missed. Right. That's Thank great. You. I'd just like to make a few comments. First of all, thank you, Dr. Mathis, Dr. Lee DeAndrea, Dan Rawyer, Dr. Melton. It's been, and I, I'm afraid I'm leaving someone out, so help me, but it has been a team effort and a dream come true. This is something that we dreamed about when I took office in 2015, January, and we really have been working toward this and could not get the funding, so a blessing <laughs> of COVID has been that we received some emergency federal funding that we were able to get this really pushed and done. I don't think any of us realize the impact that this can have. Uh, we're not going to see a lot of it in my tenure, but I think we're lay, we, have, we have laid the foundation for transformational higher quality of instruction for all of South Carolina. This product is one that only the wealthy could have. <laughs> and we are one of the few states now that we are offering this statewide. It's interoperable with other systems. I, I, I can't even explain it all, but I just know that I met with the president of this uh, platform group yesterday, and he said, that, you know, we're talking with Texas, Michigan, big, large states that always get a lot of attention, but we have something that none of them have because it is statewide. It's available to everybody. Different systems can go into it. So that's why we're winning awards. Um, and I think the next uh, administration and your this board, as you move forward into next year, and it will take a while, but you're going to start seeing the quality of instruction improve. We've got to incentivize and make sure that's, that's the hard work right now, is getting quality material into the hub, and then obviously getting people trained and ready to use this. It's no good if nobody uses it. So that's the next step. We've got a plan for that. Our folks are working already on that, and it is just so exciting, and I'm so proud of this accomplishment that our administration has been able to do, to do. We're not, we don't have it all done yet, so we can't stop working, but just thank you. Thank you all for all that you have done to make, make this happen. It is a very efficient uh, use of resources, and I believe at some point will save the state money on instructional materials. We're not there to that point. It will take a while. But as the industry of instructional material is moving to more digital, upgrading of those instructional materials because they're digital and the sharing of that because they're digital, and districts, I understand, can still choose their own textbooks, whatever material, and they can enter that in, and they can have their own separate system, too. It doesn't mean that everybody in the state has got to teach exactly the same. Of course, they'll all be working toward the standards, but they still will have that ability to choose uh, at the local level and put that into the system. So it's very, very exciting, and I just want you to know how proud and grateful I am. And... Um Superintendent Spearman, I appreciate that. And, I, and, and a lot of, all the credit goes to Lee DeAndre and Dan Relier. They, they're the brains behind this. They understand it. Um, one, of, as you mentioned, one of the great benefits is if, if you remember our, um, several months ago, I told you about the reading cur curriculum that we, devout, we um, purchased with ESSER funds for our Palmetto Literacy Project schools. Those um, publishers agreed to have it in some whatever you call it, digital um, platform that can go into the Instruction Hub. So those materials can be accessed um, digitally as well, wherever the student or teacher may be. So, And I think what Dan, if I may, what Dan Rawier has given this that nobody else has done yet, it is standard specific. He figured out a way that these lesson plans will be put in, and it is merely a click, and it is standard specific, which you would think everybody would have that, but I think we're leading the way in, in making it. It is, that and what Dan created was, um, you know when you would, teachers would go through and create our lesson plans, we'd cut and paste the standards. Uh, he made them um, machine readable, so that they can flow into those lesson plans with just a click. So. It's a huge time saver for our teachers as well. Thank you very Thank much. You. Our next report, requirements to employ retired individuals. Good 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Good other afternoon. members of the board. Um, as you're aware, pursuant to um, Section 9-1-1795 of the South Carolina Retirement Law, um, the State Board of Education annually um, designates the critical needs subject areas and critical geographic needs areas um, for the employment of retired educators who will be exempt from the $10,000 earnings limitation. Um, that limitation applies to individuals who retired before January 1st, 2013 or retired before they reached the age of 62. Um, here at the agency, we have a process where districts submit an assurance form um, related to their earnings limitation um, for eligible educators. After we approve that assurance form, we work with PEBA to make sure that each individual teacher's or educator's record is updated so that they will not um, lose any retirement benefits. The re retirement law requires that after the Department of Education approves the forms, districts must notify the State Board of Education of the engagement of retired teachers. So I stand before you today to provide that notification. Um, the document that I believe you guys have before you displays the number of educators approved for the retirement limitation waiver by district. Um, approximately 94% of all school districts in the state have submitted um, an insurance form to us or insurance forms to us. Um, the number of waiver forms continues to increase annually. Um, the, um, the number that have has been um, received and processed for fiscal school year 22 is pretty much a 15% increase over the number of um, waivers granted in fiscal year 21 and roughly a 21% increase over the number um, from 20. Um, due to the recent addition of elementary education and early childhood education, we expect going forward the number of um, assurance forms to double, if not triple. Um, so it continues to um, continues to grow. And Mr. Chairman, I'm available if there are any questions. Madam Superintendent. Ms. Williams, uh -huh. would you give the total number just for the benefit of the audience? 1,204 uh, 1, um, have been approved um, for school year 22. Any questions? All right. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. And our next item is going to be the safety update with Dr. Moore. Good afternoon, Chairman Walters and members of the board. We're excited to have this opportunity to give you a school safety update this morning or this afternoon. And so I think everybody, we distributed a copy of the, current, the 2021 Model Safe School Checklist. Um, you were informed that I think in July you'll have an opportunity to kind of up approve the checklist going forward for 2022. But we wanted to give you an opportunity to hear some information regarding the Model Safe School Checklist. So y'all, I'm going to put my glasses on because I keep thinking I don't need them, but I always do. So each year, districts are required to complete and submit the model safe school checklist in accordance with the following state laws and regulations. You'll see it. I'm not going to read them all, but the South Carolina Code of Laws 59565 which refers to the powers and responsibilities of State Board of Education. You see uh, Regulation 43.166, Proviso 1A.42. And so the, the Model Safe School Checklist is required to be completed by state law, by state regulations, and there are some additional things in, um, that's being required in regards to the provisos. The checklist is divided into 10 sections, and it's designed to help districts assess the safety strengths and weaknesses of their respective schools. So it's, it's used as an assessment tool. The um, 10 areas are listed below. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, y'all, I'm doing the slides. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm the clicker. All right. So um, again, so the 10 areas that are required by state law 
to be included on the checklist. Again, not going to read all of them, but I wanted to point out a couple. The existence of a comprehensive safety plan. The question we frequently get is whether or not all schools have a, all districts have a comprehensive safety plan. It is required by state law that they do. Subsequently, if the district has a safety plan, then all schools within that district should equally have a safety plan, and that plan should be comprehensive. The, uh, the, the checklist addresses a, a couple of other things, but training of staff and students. So it is required that districts, uh, staff and students have various trainings and the assessment of grounds and buildings. We'll talk about that farther. The procedures for handling visitors. So again, the goal is to assist districts in assessing the safety um, <coughs> parameters within the respective schools in their districts. The, the, the checklist does not, I do think it's important to note that the checklist does not ensure a safe school. It, it, it says you have the capacity based on your responses to gauge your strengths and weaknesses and to respond accordingly. The submission of the checklist is each district's indication that the district does indeed have a safety plan, one, and that safety plan is reviewed and updated annually. The annual review and update of the checklist is in accordance with Proviso 1A.42. So every year when districts submit their plans, they're literally saying, we have reviewed our plan and we've updated our plans based on the information, the activities, the, what's happening within our schools. In accordance, I'm sorry, in addition to those 10 areas, the plan, the checklist, is also aligned with the, U the U.S. Department of Education's high quality emergency plan operations. Uh, about five years ago, the Department of Education received a grant from the U.S. Department of Education um, to assist districts in developing high quality emergency operation plans. The goal of that grant is to ensure that districts are given resources, uh, namely trainings, to further advance their safety plans. So we ensure through that grant that training is provided. In 2021, the, um, based on the checklist that you have before you, all districts submitted their checklist via the South Carolina Safety Portal that was developed by the, a team from the Department of Education with input from various districts, including Charleston, Lexington One, Greenville, Dillon, Darlington. And so when in, in the goal of the portal was to ensure that districts had a single place where they could complete the checklist in addition to submitting their safety plans. Beginning, okay, so beginning this year, in 2022, districts will submit their actual safety plan. That is a first. Districts have never submitted to the Department of Safe Education their actual safety plans. They completed the checklist, which is a template. By completion of that checklist, they're able to assess strengths and weaknesses based on um, current law, so, S S709, now districts have to actually submit their plans. Next, oh y'all, Friday is the 17th. On Friday, <laughs> I am so excited that we will have, we will have an individual working within the Office of Student and Individual Services whose job is to conduct site safety assessments for schools and also to assist in reviewing of plans. That's a first for us in the sense of that, like for the Department of Education, we actually started conducting in collaboration with SLED site assessments during the pandemic. And what that means is that an individual goes out to school sites and does kind of an exterior review looking for places where there might be um, like blind spots, like in your car you have a blind spot, just looking for places where there might be blind spots or where students can hide out or someone else can hide out. You know, checking the entrance, making sure that the doors are actually locked and closed when they're supposed to be locked and closed and things of that nature. Um, so here we are today 
in terms of preparing for the 2022 checklist. So we will begin receiving input from district safety coordinators and from you as to what changes are needed to again shore up that plan. Are there areas in addition to those 10 areas that's governed by state law, are there areas that we need to shore up to assist districts in further assessing the safety of their individual schools? Recommendations and suggestions for changes for the 2022 checklist, which is due on September 1st, by the way. Some of those changes, some of those recommendations to be implemented as much as possible will be implemented prior to September 1st. However, others, if they are more complicated, might not be implemented because we would have to make changes to the portal until 2023. So the smaller changes will um, happen for before September 1st, 2022, hopefully during the summer. And then changes that require changes to the portal will go into effect the next year. <clears throat> So what services are offered and available to districts and schools? The school site safety assessment is just what we indicated, which our person will be coming up board this Friday. Um, that's a, that a site assessment, again, will be done with, in collaboration with SLED. When I said we started that during the pandemic, and so that was upon request. So 49 schools and 15 districts have undergone these site assessments and have received um, suggestions as to how to improve their sites. I, if I was um, encouraged to make sure that we knew that each of those assessments takes at least 40 hours because sometimes the assessor has to go back and then have conversations with the school. We will begin reviewing the district safety plans in the summer. Staff and contracted individuals will review the plans and make suggestions for improvement. We, don't, we are cautious about saying we will approve the plans. We suggest that we will make suggestions for improvement. Okay, So that's, that, was a, that would be a benefit to schools and districts. Targeted training and technical assistance. It is important to know that we've been doing, in, again, in collaboration with our primary partner, SLED, we've been doing active shooter training, supporting that. So for 2021, well over 3,300 um, educators and individuals were trained in active shooters. Um, I think we had close to 30 sessions. With uh, We provide uh, training related to bullying awareness and prevention. I think one of the highlights that we definitely tout is that we had over 10,000 students and educators from 75 districts to, to participate in our first virtual annual bullying summit. And so we'll continue those types of activities. I want to go to the gang awareness culture and trends because gang activity is increasing. And so we've contracted with the gang um, expert, and to date we've trained uh, as over 200 individuals within 30 districts and are preparing additional trainings. I know that um, the behavioral threat assessment is, is really important. And so during the course of 2021, we've trained over 70 individuals to be threat assessment trainers. So we've had, we have 30 individuals in 25 districts who are prepared to train their districts in threat assessment. We'll be offering some additional threat assessments from the um, training from the department um, th this summer. That is the plan. And then I just wanted to give you uh, some overview, some other trainings that we've done in 2021-22, I wanted to point out the Be Smart for Kids Gun Violence because I think that is such an important piece that kids, when, when we know that the number of children who die as a result of gun violence, a lot of those kids get those guns from home. And I think someone else referenced that. So there, is a, there are plans where we told the, um, the, the the participants that you can get locks, gun locks free of charge and things like that. So we were really wanting to make educators, districts know that here are some important tools that you can use in order to, again, shore up the safety aspects of your schools. And so there's a list of um, trainings there. 
So what are um, districts working on this summer? So in preparation for the 2022 checklist, and districts typically do these activities in the summer, but we'll put more emphasis on updating the safety plans with local law enforcement agencies. Again, that's required by state law. Scheduling or conducting on-site safety assessments, they can either um, request that through our office or the U.S. Department of Education actually has a, on, as a, as a site assessment tool and districts have taken advantage of that. We would encourage them to review their district and school level safety plans, again, in accordance with state law, conduct multi-hazard tabletop exercises. A lot of times we hear a lot about active shooters, but we got to remember all of the other hazards that are associated there, so we encourage them to conduct multi-hazard tabletop exercises. We encourage them to review their behavior threat assessment procedures, recognizing that all schools have to have threat assessment teams and then to participate in training sessions, to review and update their MOAs with their um, schools and their SROs, and then to review the videos that we put out a couple of years ago, strategies for reducing school violence, and other activities that they believe are, will be helpful in just ensuring or assuring that their schools are safe and welcome, and, and as we are welcoming students back in the fall. Are there any questions? Questions for Dr. Moore? I have a couple comments. Uh, just one thing I wanted to mention is uh, with the uh, checklist you've got here today, anytime that there's a major incident like the tragedy we just had in Texas, we go back and look at all of our practices, procedures, and so that's what made this an opportune time to go back and uh, look at our checklist, see what improvements we need to make, changes, edits that need to go into it. And uh, so that's why that's going to be undertaken, and we'll have to have that special call meeting to approve that. Yeah. And Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Dr. Moore, thank you so much. Would you mind introducing your staff who work in this area? Oh, well, Kimberly. She said, she's right there. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, for contacts, Kimberly Smith is the school climate and safety liaison. I think she's been, what, 12 plus years? Um, and so, Kimberly is our liaison with the district safety coordinators. She handles calls that come in and go out, and she does the bullying um, training and things of that nature. And definitely just responsible for um, meeting with the district coordinators and making sure that we address any needs that they convey to us. And may you announce the gentleman who'll be joining us on Friday? Is that public information, the new... Stafford. He's accept, he's returned his letter of acceptance. Okay, all right. So <laughs> I can month. next month. Okay. Uh, just I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments. Um, when I took office in tw January 2015, you may remember Mr. Walters helped us with that. Uh, not a board member, I don't believe at that time. Uh, Mr. Brennan and others were, but we did a school safety task force. Mm -hmm. uh, met for months, came up with recommendations, had law enforcement, everyone involved, and I think really made some pretty significant improvements to what was happening at the time. The resource officer contract, the training for resource officers. There, there were several things that we looked at very in-depthly, in and, and I think there were improvements. But this is an area that is always evolving. We're always learning. And new products, new equipment, new trainings become available. We just, we learn more. Unfortunately, from every incident that happens, I think the protocols improve a little bit. So that's why uh, I'm for, you know, so sad about what happened in Texas. And we actually, at near the end of the school year, you know, had a uh, loss of child in, at, at um, Tanglewood Middle School up in Greenville. So we're always trying to improve on this. And I, I want y'all to know that I am committed in working with the staff to really up our ante as much as we can between now and the end of the year. So that's why I asked Dr. Moore, in fact, we are sending out, I hope it went out today, but shortly, uh, a notice to school districts to say, uh, while their checklist is not due until September 1st, and this whole idea of them for the first time putting the plans into our portal and us reviewing, that's a new responsibility that we have. We're upping that, and we're asking them to turn that around quickly. I'm asking them, if, 
as authority of the state superintendent that they have those put in the portal by July 1. So it's a quick turnaround, and we are going to hire some folks. It's a, it's a huge task, but I think we must begin immediately reviewing those plans in hopes to give recommendations to school districts or say, wonderful job you're ready for school to open in August. So we've got a lot of work to do in this area, and I, I want you all to know that we're going to do everything we can. I've also asked our staff, as, as Dr. Moore showed, the areas that we work in, active shooter training, bullying, um, the behavioral assessment, all such important issues that we really need to go back and assess how we're doing and we need, to, we need to improve and enhance what we're doing. I, th I think sometimes we get on to something and we do it really well for a year or two, and we train a lot of people, but the reality is those people move into different roles, and you've got to keep doing that. So I've asked them to really assess what we're doing there, particularly around bullying. Um, and also, I think one of the preventive measures that Chief Kill asked us to do was to require that every school have a behavioral threat assessment team. Some call it other things. But this is the group who can come together. A teacher says, I'm worried about Johnny. He's been acting strange, very isolated, whatever the issue. They come together and talk about it and proactively try and do something to help that child in hopes that it won't get to a worse situation. So I think all of our schools, we did a really good job with that over maybe two years ago as that first started. But we need to make sure that because of COVID, things have gotten a little lax, that we really, really push that over the summer, do extra trainings, make sure every school is up and ready running. So uh, those are some of the things that I think we can do now. A lot of folks want to talk about gun issues and changes in laws. That's the legislature's role. And a lot of the, that cannot happen if they choose to when they come back into session. Congress has to act. But what can we do here as the agency working with districts? So we're going to commit to you and all board members and the people of South Carolina that we're really going to do everything we possibly can to make sure our schools assess where they are, make the improvements necessary so that when school starts in August that we're even more ready than we have been. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next items are our district updates. Ms. Mack. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your time and attention to the district updates. In Allendale County School District, on May 27th, Allendale Fairfax, Allendale Fairfax High School celebrated the class of 22 at their graduation. 51 students graduated, and they received over $4 million in scholarship offers. In Florence 4, um, Timmonsville High School hosted its final graduation on Friday, June 3rd at the Florence Center. 32 students graduated. Um, a number of those students were um, graduating in three years. They were juniors, and um, I, I did attend that graduation. What was really neat is that they had the valedictorian and salutatorian speak, and then they also had the young man that probably would have been the valedictorian for the class of 2023, who um, graduated in three years. They also gave him an opportunity to speak, and it was very um, touching. In Williamsburg County on Saturday, June 4th, um, Williamsburg County School District honored their graduates. Hemingway High School graduated 60 students. C.E. Murray hosted its final graduating class of 52 students. And King Street High School graduated 110 students, which was their final graduating class without being consolidated with C.E. Murray High School. So this concludes my report. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you very Thank much. You. May I make a comment? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'm delaying the meeting, but there's these That's issues are just stuff. so important, and you all have been such a part of that. Uh, Florence 4 will be dissolved in about a week and become part of Florence 1. That's been major. Kim, Mac, thank you for being there to assist. It has not been easy. 
uh, Kim's mother lives there in that area and, and understands probably better than anyone in this room uh, what the emotions that those folks have been going through to lose their high school. Uh, we still, I still stand firm that down the road, looking back on it, they will be able to say it was the best thing that ever happened for our students. But I know right now it's hard to see that. But thank you for what you've done. We are so proud of Timsville and the students there and for them uh, who will be moved, those who will be going into Florence One next year. Uh, I want to tell you um, that I have been meeting with the, we met actually yesterday with the officers of the Williamsburg Board, uh, continued conversations about the transition so that at some point in hopefully the near future before I leave office or but it's not a done deal, as I told them. It's, we're watching the actions of the board, and they have to build up their reputation because the reputation had really dissolved. And it is up to them in these meetings that they're having where they don't really take a lot of action, no action, but they're receiving training. They're beginning to have conversations, and they're building the confidence of that community, and especially those employees who, quite honestly, are very, very nervous most of them, about us leaving and transferring power back to the local board, who quite honestly was not doing a very good job when we went in. So the employees are nervous. So that is what this whole transition time is about, both in Allendale and Williamsburg, that they start meeting, having conversations, and really building trust, as well as receiving training so that they can all do a really good job. So I'm committed. We all are committed to try to make that happen. But again, we will not transfer out until we feel confident that they're ready to do that. So just know that, but I'm so excited. And actually the Williamsburg board folks told us yesterday that they can't believe how excited the students are between C.E. Murray, you heard, what, 30 students, I think, graduate 50 maybe, they're going to be joining King Street, which will make a nice class of about 200 graduates for the future. But the cheerleaders are already getting together. The teams are getting together. And really, the students are very excited. Now, pr probably there's some who are not, but overall, the excitement is there. The community is doing a beautiful job. The booster clubs are coming together. Um, I'm just, I'm really thankful for the attitude of the people down in Williamsburg for this uh, joining of C.E. Murray and King Street High School. So a lot's going on in the next couple of weeks, and you all have been a part of that, and I just appreciate it. Appreciate Dr. Wilder and her leadership, and Kim, thank you again for all you've done. Kathy, everybody's really had a lot of extra work on their plates. We don't get extra people when we manage districts. We add that as other duties as a sign. So yesterday when we met with Williamsburg, we explained to them that our legal department has been their legal department. They have not paid for legal, uh, maybe a few things where we've had to contract, but really, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been saved because Kathy's office has taken care of that for them. So there, there's a lot to the transition, and we're trying to do it in a very efficient and, and set way so we can make a good decision at the end of the year, this calendar year. Thank you. Here, here. All right. We're at other business, which means the reminder about your travel forms. And certainly one. let's keep... Um, Dr. Stapleton and Ms. Frierson and our thoughts and prayers. Both of them had personal family emergencies come up today, and that's why they aren't here with us. And we hope everything is going to turn out all right for both of their families. Now, and I got one more, <laughs> and I promise I'll let you go. But this is very bittersweet for me because this young man has been with me since the day I decided I was going to run for office, January the 14th of 2014, and we've been together almost every day. Ryan Brown, would you stand up? and come up to the podium. Don't have a present for you. Don't have a present for you, but Ryan has served as our director of uh, communications, and then actually his official title is chief communications officer, and he has done a fantastic job of learning this agency and being the spokesperson for this agency for educational work, but over the last two years, he really was our go-to man on COVID. 
and worked so closely with all of us, the school districts across the state, the governor's office, and particularly DHEC. And all along, y'all, everybody's been trying to steal Ryan because they just say so many complimentary things about him. The press across South Carolina always, wherever I am, they always come up and say what a fantastic job he has done, how responsive he has been over the years. So I appreciate it. Uh, but I knew one day would come when he would need to go and find, uh, accept a job. He's had lots of offers, but Ryan will be leaving us at the end of this month uh, to go into private work uh, with a public relations firm, uh, and we will miss you. I'll miss you particularly. All of us going to miss you, but as being a good leader, he has done an exceptional job in a succession plan, Mr. Brennan. That's important for a leader to have their people ready. So I'm going to ask these two folks, Katrina Goggins, if you'll come up and stand with Ryan and Derek Phillips. Uh, Katrina Goggins, who came to us a few months ago, has extensive uh, experience in uh, communications, public relations, school district work, and she will become, at the end of this month, the chief communications, communications officer, uh, fill, fulfill Ryan's role. And Derek Phillips, who has also been with us, will, is Director of Communications. And each of them, they'll be sharing responsibilities. Derek has a little bit more to do. But uh, Katrina will be the, uh, the boss, <laughs> <laughs> uh, along with Ryan for the rest of the month. But I want you all to um, welcome them. And let's thank Ryan for his great work. Well, Mr. Communications Officer, we don't get a speech? Come on. No speech. Uh, I, I'll tell you this. I, I wouldn't have stayed here this long if it wasn't for this lady. So I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity that you've given me to, to serve this agency, the board, and, and the state. And uh, it is bittersweet. And you always be my second mother. <laughs> People think he's my son, and he is partly, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, I know way too much about education, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with that knowledge, but um, uh, I'll, figure I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out, and I'll still be in the Columbia area. I don't know that I'll ever... Maybe probably not come to another board meeting. But <laughs> <laughs> I might be one of the 15 people that right, are watching online. What firm you're going with? Uh, so we do. Sure. Uh, I'm going to work at uh, Turnoff Newman. Um, I'll oversee their public accounts, um, other state agencies, except for the Department of Ed. So um, still be kind of in the space, uh, working on some stuff related to things that you do, but not not directly with the agency. But I'm excited to do something new. Um, branch out and not not do education every day, uh, but uh, I've, I have enjoyed being here. But um, uh, it's really just been a joy because you've been the best person to work with. Let so me know thank if you. you need any help with Lee Bussell. I could <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. And I, I know that you probably pay him for forty hours a week, but he's available twenty four seven. I know nights, weekends, over the last few years, when whenever I reach out, I get an answer. So uh, I want to thank you as well. All right. Unless there is any other business, this meeting will be adjourned.